Hello and welcome to this episode of ECA Safer Chemicals podcast. Today, we will be talking about a project carried out by national customs and enforcement authorities who joined forces to check if products imported in the European market comply with obligations set by EU chemicals and packaging laws. Now, as part of this project, authorities from 16 EU countries inspected nearly 1,400 products imported into the EU. Most of the inspected products were jewelries and metals, such as tins, knives, and cooking pots, followed by a small number of plastic and leather products, such as plastic cutlery and food packaging. They found that nearly one in every four inspected products violated EU laws, including how they were labeled and packaged. They also failed to meet the requirements for harmful chemicals, such as lead and cadmium, that can have severe health impacts and are restricted in the EU. My guests today are Erwin Annis from the European Chemicals Agency, who works on coordinating support and enforcement activities on an EU level. We're also joined by Dr. Maria Orfanu, an inspector from the Ministry of Labor, Welfare and Social Insurance in Cyprus. She is also the chair of the working group for this project. Last but not least, we are also pleased to welcome Miguel Aguado from the European Commission. Let's get started with you, Maria. Could you briefly explain why this project was done and what obligations were checked during the inspections? During previous projects, there was a high non-compliance rate uh, observed in imported articles, meaning um, articles uh, manufactured in third countries and imported into the member states. And additionally, there are weekly several uh, non-compliance uh, products published in the European Rapex catalog, the um, rapid alert system for non-food products. Uh, we therefore decided to proceed to checks uh, for products entering the European market, but still under custom supervision before they are released for free circulation. Uh, products uh, were checked for the presence of uh, restricted substances, and also chemical mixtures were checked for their proper classification, labeling and packaging according to the CLP regulation. Um, the restrictions were prioritized uh, mainly uh, for nickel, lead and cadmium. We have to emphasize here that uh, restrictions are the most severe prohibition measure of the rich regulation. And uh, they basically ban the use of extremely hazardous chemicals in mixtures or in articles. Okay, thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about the types of products that were checked? Almost uh, 1,400 products uh, were checked. These were mostly jewelries. And um, other types of products were also checked for restrictions, like uh, footwear, um, textiles, um, leather items, uh, uh, upholsteries, uh, toys, etc. Uh, for chemicals mixtures, uh, uh, the products mostly checked they were washing and cleaning preparations, uh, followed by coatings, um, paints, uh, thinners, and uh, paint removers. And where were the highest uh, in compliances? The highest non-compliance rate was for cadmium in jewellery. Uh, hexavalent chromium was also detected uh, at a high uh, rate in uh, leather items. So uh, this is definitely worrying since it's an extremely hazardous uh, chemical. We definitely want to eliminate from humans and the environment. For CLP checks, uh, the, the major issues were with CLP labelling, uh, with the correct labelling. Um, Mostly it was on the absence of the use of the national language on the label, followed by the uh, absence or wrong hazard or precautionary statements. Okay, and this is important information that should, of course, be visible on any product uh, on the European market. So it is, is, it is a bit worrying. Um, can you explain a bit where the uh, incompliant products came from? Most of the compliant products uh, originate from China, uh, 74% almost. But uh, USA was the country of origin for most of the non-compliant CLP products. With such a high number of incompliance, um, as a consumer, should I be worried about potentially buying unsafe products? 
Actually, uh, we should see this uh, the other way around, and um, consumers uh, should now feel safer because the national enforcement authorities are carried out, are carrying out more and uh, checks on imported products, and they are also uh, prohibiting the entrance of non-compliant goods into the European single market. What about then concrete tips? For consumers, um, how do I make sure that I don't end up with harmful products? What can I do? A lot of non-compliant products uh, are of unknown origin, and uh, they don't bear any product uh, characteristics, uh, such as the EAN numbers, which uh, make uh, the traceability of non-compliant products easier by companies and by consumers. Uh, therefore, we should all try and buy products from known and trustworthy suppliers. Um, in addition, uh, consumers can always ask the retailer for more information uh, on the applicable restrictions or for the products they, they intend to buy, or uh, they can use the scan for chem application, uh, by which basically they send a request to the retailer to ask uh, for uh, more information in, in relation to the content of the product uh, for specific hazardous chemical. Uh, another option is to check the labeling of the chemical for uh, indications like uh, phthalates or azocalarans or bisphenol A free. Uh, for um, household chemicals, consumers uh, should pay attention uh, that the, they bear proper labeling in their own national language and uh, they should also take the time to read the label. Thanks a lot for, for clarifying, and especially the tips for consumers were very helpful. I'm sure the, the listeners will find them useful. When an incompliance was found, what kind of actions were taken by the inspectors um, against these companies who were, who were breaking the law, essentially? The most widely used measure by the National Enforcement Authorities uh, was the prohibition for placing the product on the market, followed by the written advice. Um, out of the 23% not compliant products, the 21 of them were not released for free circulation and uh, they were either destroyed, uh, um, re-exported or held in temporary storage. For the remaining pro non-compliant products, um, uh, correcting actions have been undertaken by the importers and supervised by the national enforcement authorities before they are released for free circulation. Uh, in addition, 17 criminal complaints and 28 fines have been imposed. Of course, in an ideal world, uh, inspections would come out 100% clean, everybody completely compliant. Um, so I think the main message here is that compliance really starts from the companies. If they have the right knowledge and tools at their, at their uh, fingertips to make the right choices on what products they import, the, the results will be better. So. What are your recommendations to these companies who are importing to Europe? We have two main recommendations to the importing companies. Uh, the first one is to conduct uh, their non-use supplier uh, and to check the um, compliance for the products they intend to import before the actual importation. If the rigid CLP provisions cannot be met, then, then it can turn to another supplier, uh, either a European or a non-European one. And um, the second suggestion is to conduct uh, their national health desks for precise guidance uh, in relation to the type of products they intend to import. Uh, um, importers should bear in mind that, for example, uh, specific uh, restri uh, different restrictions apply for different types of products. And uh, therefore, uh, they should get uh, targeted advice in relation to the type of products they intend to import before these products reach the European market. Maybe to add, also the European Chemicals Agency can be clearly of help uh, in for this issue, in the sense that we have been uh, releasing this year the UCLEF, the European Chemicals Legislation Finder, which is giving all kind of information of substances which are restricted or forbidden in 40 different pieces of legislation. This can be, of course, 
extremely helpful for the importers to communicate, but it can also be something which is extremely important that everyone which is exporting towards the European Union has a clear and simple overview of what is allowed and what is not allowed on the European market. All right, good point. Yes, and I understood also that Euclid is being expanded with more legislation. So hopefully uh, we'll see a, a few more coming next year. Yeah. Um, and also the tool is available on the ECHO website. So yeah. you can easily use our search for chemicals to access this information, or you have a dedicated Euclid landing page where you have yeah. a list of legislations and the restricted substances within each legislation. One more question now related to... Um, I mean, you've talked about how these checks have been carried out. And of course, this was a project of its own that really focused on this. But on average, how often do EU countries actually do these kinds of inspections to make sure that the products that are arriving are actually safe? Uh, every year, the national authorities carry out their own uh, national inspections according to their set priorities. In addition, they participate uh, to the forums uh, pan-European uh, or pilot uh, harmonized projects. Uh, up to now, Forum has concluded uh, seven uh, such projects uh, with the participation of all member states and the several pilot uh, projects uh, such as this one in which member states uh, participate according to their priorities or capabilities. It's obvious that uh, checks for the chemical legislation should be more stringent and uh, more emphasis should be given in with other authorities, uh, such as uh, customs or health and safety. Um, these actions have also been proposed under the currently concluded uh, REACH review. Right. And I also understood that one of the outcomes of this project was to indeed um, improve cooperation between the different authorities and, and to, to carry out these checks more together, which will surely be a benefit um, as well. Yeah, I can add uh, something here. We, the Commission, every five years, we are receiving uh, information from the member states, how many controls they are doing every, uh, every year. And the last reporting has been really this June. And then the preliminary data from the member states, we are having that uh, the member states are control are making between 60 and 70,000 controls per year, really, in, a, in the European Union. Would you say that's a big number, 60 to 70,000? I think it's a good number. And I also comparing with also with other legislation is a quite a huge, a, quite a big number. Okay. Also, I would like to add another thing. It's about the, the rates of, uh, of non-compliance. Uh, sometimes it's perceived that really the, the rates of non-compliance is too high. Um, in the, in the, from the information that we are having really from member states, more or less the level of non-compliance found in all the activities that the, the member states are doing is around 80%. I have to say, is the eighty percent compliance, then twenty percent non-compliance. Then uh, this uh, data is really uh, in line, really, with other type of legislations. And then this is, uh, I don't see that really uh, there is a high level of non-compliance really in the chemical sector compared with other sectors. What about then? What more could be done? So even outside of enforcement to improve the situation in Europe. Uh, the working group uh, concluded that a more spherical solution should be sought for all imported products in the coming years. And preferably this can be under the new market surveillance uh, regulation, which will enter into force uh, next June 2021. So Erwin, can you explain the reflections on the conclusions of this project in particular, and how do they compare with the previous ones? Well, indeed, we see certain tendencies uh, where you see that uh, certain incompliances are not clearly improving. Hence, we really have to continue this inspection work. I think it's already extremely good that we have been now looking and combining this with the customs because there you have really the inspection before it is entering the European Union. That's where I'm believing that we have to continue with involving the customs in this kind of project in order to stop this at the border of the European Union rather than trying to find and correct when it's into the European Union. 
on uh, the labeling we know that it's indeed a major difficulty um, in a European Union with 23 languages uh, where every product has to be labeled according to national uh, language it is important that this is respected in order to make it possible that every citizen in the European is understanding but it's also very clear that we need to think on how can we communicate this much better to the rest of the world that English is not the only language of the European Union. What in your view could be done in the future by the forum uh, to tackle the issues with imported products specifically and are there more projects on this uh, coming soon? We will go to a much bigger project related to substances in articles imported or made in the European Union and looking at all the different aspects, be it under REACH or be it under the CLP obligations to see where we are. If you look at the communication of the Commission on the circular economy, it's clearly mentioned that the imported articles and what they are containing is something extremely important and has to be looked at. And it's also our expectation that in the chemicals strategy for sustainability, where we expect the publication end of September, beginning of October, that this will also play a crucial role. Miguel, uh, next questions are for you. So can you explain a little bit why the control of imports is so important? Um, and what's the role of the Commission specifically to ensure that safe products are coming into the European market? We in the European Union, we have choose to set up really the most stringent chemical management system in the world. But this has impacts in other areas. We need to mobilize resources of our customs authorities to control imports. We need to, uh, to see if all the chemicals are re registered. We need to see if the mixture is properly labeled, or for instance, if the toys are really compliant with the phthalate uh, restrictions. We want uh, customs inspectors to contribute to the enforcement of reach and seal. We need to find ways to facilitate the work to control chemical legislation. Customs cannot go case by case and really checking all the single uh, goods that are entering in the, in, the, in the Union, then we need to facilitate their, their work. And that's really the role of the Commission. We are trying to facilitate the cooperation amongst chemicals and customs inspectors and integrate chemical requirements into the customs procedures in the current customs procedures and in the future ones that also, as I say, that really digitalization is going to play a, a good role. So that's the overall commission uh, role on a higher level. What about your involvement in this and similar um, forum projects in the past? Can you talk a little bit about those? The commission is actively contributing to many forum activities and the results of this project shows that we need to continue really to help the member states to a better enforce and to be more um, better and, and, and really to enforce really chemical legislation. How did the results of this project concretely then uh, in other ways, if you have any additions, feed into the work of the Commission? All the activities of the forum have some repercussions to the really the work of the Commission. Most of the activities, uh, most of the activities has, for, for example, a list of recommendations to the Commission. And therefore, we analyze all of them. One example is the established program for exchange of inspectors that the Commission is running since uh, three years. This program comes from the exchange of views, uh, really between the member states and the Commission. The encouragement to continue this program is one of the recommendations of this project. Moreover, this project has opened the eyes to us really to see that really also the customs authorities can also benefiting can benefit from this um, uh, from this exchange of inspectors pro uh, program has been recognized as well the usefulness of screening technologies that really the, in the in that project uh, we have been uh, the member state they have been using and then the support for the customs authorities really to use uh, screening um, uh, screening tools is also one of the recommendations that really also we are looking at. 
Another matter is, of course, uh, the Commission has really established uh, bilateral meetings with third countries. We have countries where we have uh, bilateral meetings with all uh, countries in the world. And then the, this uh, recurrent issue of non-compliance and restrictions is something that has uh, coming really for, for some years. Uh, what I really wanted to add uh, to uh, Miguel's uh, comment is that uh, actually one of the recommendations of the working group was that more harmonization needs to be done on the on how the products stop for control in various member states, because uh, at the moment each member state uh, performs its own risk analysis. So they stopped uh, products uh, based on different priorities. And this may result in the so-called free riders, which is maybe companies switching uh, points of entrance uh, in order to get their products easier into the European market. Okay, thank you. Um, so you covered a lot of the actions that the Commission will be taking. There's also this uh, these TARIC, uh, T-A-R-I-C codes, which are uh, new to me. Can you explain a little bit uh, what those are and how they, they can be used? The TARIC is a database integrating all measures really uh, relating to EU customs uh, tariffs, really commercial or agricultural legislation. Every good that enters into the union really has to have a certain uh, um, they have to comply with the EU legislation. What are our measures? As I mentioned, really the first ones that has been integrated has been the Annex 14 uh, substances. What now? Everybody that is importing really a substance of Annex 14, they will be asked what is their authorization number. In the case that they don't have it, of course there are some possibilities that really that um, that substance can be exempted from authorization, but they need to explain why they're exempted. And later on, that information can be taken by the enforcement authorities to follow up. The implementation of restrictions is taking longer because they are more difficult by definition. The restrictions are more complicated because sometimes they restrict a group of chemicals, for instance, lead and its compounds. And also, they sometimes also they apply to a bunch of, of goods or a, a limited number of goods, for instance, jewelry or leather and articles. In, in such implementation, we need to take a case by case, really every restriction to see what are the products that really may uh, tackle really with the with Annex, uh, Annex 17 restriction. And then the outcome of this project also is going to be very useful for us because it will help us really to integrate really the Annex 17 substances into the TAREC system because somehow we know much more what are the products that are non-compliance with the, with the restrictions and we, with that such a, a intelligence or such a knowledge, really we can uh, target much better really in the TAREC system. And that concludes this episode of our podcast. Thank you to our guests for the interesting discussions and to you, our listeners, for tuning in. More information about the findings of the project and the full report are available on our website at chemicalsinourlife.eca.europa.eu.